Okay, let's start. Uh, then, uh, welcome everyone. And um, today we have another AT&T seminar, and we are happy to have uh, John Donahue, and he will speak about uh, quadratic gravity. So please. Start. Okay. Great. So let's start sharing the screen. You see the screen, okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so my topic here is this funny theory of quadratic gravity. It's a. It's in some ways a conservative theory because it has, it's a renormalizable theory for gravity with the metric as the field. Um, but as we'll see, it has some oddities. But my main interest in it is, is whether it makes a valid quantum field theory or not. If it, if it doesn't, that's okay. We'll move on to the more exotic possibilities that are most people work on. If it is, Simplicity then says it sh it should be the a a candidate in the the range of theories, and we should ask it questions about interesting topics. So it does it work or not? This is mostly work with my collaborator in Brazil, Gabriel Menez, um, along, but it other people have worked on it. So let's just <coughs> mention some of the. <coughs> early people. So it started mostly with Stella and um, several others quite a while ago. The community as a whole sort of moved off into supergravity and, and left this behind. There's been activity in more recent times by a set of people. So there's a sub little subfield working on it. Um, and other people who do things that are similar enough. Um, what I'm going to do is this is an overview. It's it's not just one topic in there, but I'm going to talk about the three biggest issues: stability, causality, and unitarity, and then try to summarize at the end with some things that are not known because I, I don't think the answer is completely there. Although it's worth seems worth to continue exploring. Um, so first, here's the theory. The theory includes not only the curvature, but curvature squared terms. The C is the vial tensor, which is just some combination of curvatures. Um, and since the curvatures go like two derivatives, curvature squareds go like four. And the extra powers of momentum in the propagators then tame the UV behavior and make it renormalizable. You can sort of see that because the, the curvature squared terms have dimensionless coefficients. If you, they govern the UV behavior. If you do loops with them using dimensional regularization, there's no dimensions around to give anything else but them back again. So you get the same curvatures back again. Um, it can be weakly coupled if those parameters are small. And so it's, it, it's a thing, a theory that seems like it's worth exploring. The bad news is tied to the same feature that is, that's the good news. The, since the curvature squares carry four derivatives, the propagators carry momentum to the fourth. And momentum, higher derivative theories always do something bad for the quantum field theory. Um, in the phrase terminology that seems to be becoming popular, they break quantum field there. Um, you can see that in a single propagator, if you just partial fraction it, it has the, the terms that you see um, has a high mass state with a the wrong sign in the propagator. That's going to lead to something. What is something? And you can see that it has to do something bad because in, by the axiomatic field theorists tell us the Schell and Lehman representation that the propagator should go like some spectral function divided by Q squared. Uh, spectral function is positive definite. So Q squared goes to infinity. This can't fall faster than one over Q squared. So, that breaks the Schiele and Lehman representation. Um, so there's something that must give. 
and you think of all the axioms as unitarity, causality, Lorentz invariance, blah, blah, blah. You can, something's got to give. Um, there is a bit of a caveat. Um, this is not, the schleiden lehmann representation isn't true for gauge currents because they have spurious states, gauge propagators, um, spurious states with negative norms, which are however gauge artifacts. Um, and then, for example, in QCD, it doesn't, it, it falls faster, logarithmically faster than one over Q squared. Um, but it doesn't seem to be the case here. It's relevant for spin zero, but it doesn't seem to be relevant for spin two. Spin two has all the features of other theories where you don't have gauge currents. We'll, we'll be back to this point. So I'm going to take a particular pathway through this theory. And one of the things I've we've learned is that if you take different pathways, you may get different answers because our pathways are designed for standard theories and not higher derivative theories. So for example, if we started with classical physics, like we often do classical physics, canonical quantization, turn on the interactions and then repeat it with path integrals only later, that's how we teach things. That would actually probably, that would fail because classical physics of this is not, is funny. Um, we're going to start with the path integral, including the interactions because they turn out to be important for analyzing the spectrum and then limit to low energy and you get classical physics going that way. I and mean, that's what we do with the electroweak theory. You don't do Yang, SU2 Yang Mills classical theories, you first couple to the Higgs and then find the spectrum and then get go to low energy. So it's not an unusual thing to do, but it may give different answers if you do different things. And we do it because there's you don't need to do certain things. You don't need to do canonical quantization of the ghost this way, for example. Um, it, you, ju you just do the path integral over the ghost field. Um, and it may give a different answer than if you did it some other pathway. And also the equivalence between Lorentzian and Euclidean um, may be different for such theories because they may have different, different ways to go to connect to Euclidean. Um, anyway, so those are caveats. So now that now the physics. Um, the first topic is going to be stability. And here we have as our guide, the original work from the 19th century by Officer Gradsky. Um, he studied theories with extra time derivatives. When you do that, you have extra coordinates and momentum. He chose the Hamiltonian to reproduce Hamilton's equations and gets a Hamiltonian that's not positive definite. So that, that's often used to rule out higher derivative theories. We'll see that the quantum treatment isn't exactly the same as this. And so that's, that's a, an interesting case of why there's the, this clash and is this theory stable or not. So what I'm gonna do is let's not do gravity yet. This is actually, having worked through it, you find out that the physics is basically the same as this very simple model with only scalar fields. Um, the, there's, the only complications are the interactions are much more complicated, but the, the spectrum and stuff is the same. So here's my simple theory that's supposed to mimic up a higher derivative theory. The normal version of it has a, a light field, which um, will actually, even though there's no symmetry enforcing it, will often consider m goes to zero. Um, this is like the photon or the graviton, the scalar field phi. There's then a matter field that's going to be massive and couple up to the, the light field with a Yukawa-like coupling. 
So you think of the um, chi like an electron or a massive particle and phi like the photon or graviton. One phi exchange then gives you the Newtonian or Coulomb potentials, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is then, this, the, as I have written it here, it's just a normal theory. But then we fancy it up. We take that simple, pretty little theory and make it dangerous by adding higher derivatives. The higher derivatives live only in the phi sector. And I think of this as this M is like the Planck mass, something beyond where we've done experiments, but um, nevertheless, it's in the theory. Now, if you treated this as an effective field theory, we know how to do that with this being treated as a perturbation. There's nothing special that goes on about that. It's just the perturbation. Um, if we treat it as a fundamental theory, Ostrogradsky says it's unstable even at low energies. And our the question is, is that true? Is, it, is there a classical limit? Is it stable at low energies? Is it stable at high energies? And since this is not a gauge theory, what, what's the field theory principle that fails when we analyze a theory like this? Okay, so let's let's treat it. The, I'm going to, as I said, use the path integral to define the theory. So it's this higher derivative of Lagrangian, and I'm going to have the coupling to the to the matter field in to the electron. And I'm going to analyze that this path integral. This is the one that should should be un, unstable if Ostrogradsky's right. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of manipulations. I'm going to first use an auxiliary field to remove the higher derivative term. So the original Lagrangian is the same as this Lagrangian here where I've, I've used this auxiliary field eta, um, which when you integrate out eta, you get back the original four derivative term simple to do. Um, so that's exactly the same path integral. And now I redefine variables. I take phi and call it A like the photon minus eta. And if I make that change in this original, this Lagrangian, I, I totally separate the Lagrangians out. I get the photon one, if you want a massless field with a coupling to the matter. And I have a massive field with coupling to matter, um, which is the eta. And now the remnant of that higher derivative sits in this overall minus sign right there. You can't get rid of that. That's what we saw when we partial fractioned the propagator. That's the minus sign that gives a funny propagator. Okay, But as far as this analysis goes, I'm just now putting this back in the path integral. I have the usual path integral for a massless field. And I have a, a slightly unusual path integral for this heavy field, where instead of plus i, I have minus i. So it's just, but this is really, it's just still a Gaussian integral. It's the complex conjugate of, of a usual path integral. So it's actually easy to do. It's just, you do the path integral. Um, usual path integral and complex conjugated. Um, if I do it, I'm, I'm doing it not by analytic continuation, but by adding a little convergence factor. Um, I, I shift the field, I do the Gaussian integral, and I get a propagator. I'm calling it the Feynman propagate with a minus sign there just because it had the minus sign overall. And it has this feature, there's a minus sign up here, which is the minus sign we saw before in that partial fractioning. And then instead of plus I epsilon, which is usually occurs in my, my metric, I have a minus I epsilon there. So 
is not surprising. This is just the complex conjugate of, of the usual propagator. The complex conjugate, you get that, and you get that changing sign. It results in a Gaussian integral, which is this. At low energy, that becomes a contact interaction. This becomes just one over m squared. And you shift the, the chi to the fourth integration by a small amount. Can be, this is a, remember, this is the Planck mass. Uh, G is dimensionful in this case, but um, this, this then is a very, very tiny shift in the, the quartic interaction. But it's, it's then limits to a particularly simple and normal theory. It's, it's basically the original theory with just a small shift due to the massive state buried in the value of lambda. There's no sign of the instability. It has a normal classical limit. Um, so Ostrogradsky hasn't been seen in this calculation. Um, let me just do high energy quickly. Then we're going to do high energy again in more detail, but let's just do it. So at high energy, if you if you go back to the original basis and calculate, you basically all you're doing is adding a the vacuum uh, imaginary part into the vacuum polarization, and that's going to be an important feature. When you do that and follow it through, you find that the the propagator near the massive state is again, it's it's the complex conjugate of the previous one. And um, so there's a minus I gamma here. We're normally in the, um, treatments we'd have plus I gamma there. So again, we're gonna come back to that. My point here is actually that, that doing it this way, you, you see that you need positive energy to produce the state. It's, it's a resonance. It looks like a bright Wigner res resonance with, um, that where positive energy has to flow in to produce it. So we, we see this as a positive energy resonance. It's a bit funny, but it's still positive energy. So what, what would Ostrogradsky say about this theory? Um, so Ostrogradsky notes correctly that you need extra canonical coordinates. We've used this as A and eta, those two fields that we ended up with. Each, his treatment chooses phi and phi dot as the two coordinates. The momentum conjugate to them are then calculated by standard techniques. He forms the Hamiltonian by usual pi phi dot minus L. Um, the slight complication that you remove phi double dot by the coordinates and momentum since that's, that's neither a coordinate nor a momentum by itself. I'm um, sorry. And then you end up with the final Hamiltonian. So this is what Otsukratsky would say is the Hamiltonian in this case. Pi one, phi two, pi two stuff. Pi two is over here. Pi one only enters right there. Is since these are treated in a Hamiltonian treatment as independent variables, pi one can have either sign, phi two can have either sign. This then is not positive definite. It can be. Um, either sign, and so there's a that's that's the Ostrogradsky instability, um, in that the Hamiltonian is not positive definite, um, independent of what the interactions are. But this is a funny construction. We when we were doing the field theory, we had a and eta as our final variables. Um, phi and phi dot would not have ever entered our head. Why did he choose that? 
Well, he's, ch he's chosen it to reproduce Hamilton's equations. Um, and they do, the Euler Lagrange. So here's Hamilton's equations and that's satisfied by the, his choices. And the Euler Lagrange equation comes out as one of the Hamilton's equations. But it's a different construction. It's not, you know, so we've we know for normal theories that Hamilton's equations and the usual constructions are equivalent to a Lagrangian treatment. But you know, it's, it's easily possible that in these higher derivative theories, this is not the correct procedure. It's certainly not the, the field theory procedure. Um, I don't really want to dwell on canonical quantization, but it, let me just spend one slide on it. Uh, you can actually do canonical quantization for this type of theory. It was done by Lee and Wick back in the 60s called indefinite metric quantization. And, and others have worked on this since. Um, I don't really want to do everything in detail to show to make sure that this is sensible, but basically it comes down to, even if you just follow your nose, you've got a Lagrangian with a funny sign there, the canonical momentum associated with this coordinate with eta is actually negative the usual thing. Normally it's plus eta dot. So the, the usual commutators end up being in terms of the, the field variables, the uh, minus sign, so if you use the usual field decompositions, if you want to solve this commutator, so again, it's interesting, this is the complex conjugate of the usual thing, just like the path interval is the complex conjugate. To solve that, you choose a funny minus sign there in the commutations for creation operators. And then the Hamiltonian, which follows from that, which does have an extra minus sign, of course, um, actually gives positive energies when acting on states because these commutators when you act on a state, um, it pick up a minus sign. So you can you can do canonical quantization with this funny choice, this indefinite metric that reproduces the same positive energy states. Whether you whether that's going to reproduce everything that's the path integral, I don't know, but at least at this stage you can do that. So the conclusion of, of this start part is that the quantum treatment is different from the Koster-Gradsky treatment and doesn't exhibit signs of the instability at, at this level, okay? Maybe it's gonna come back some later time, but okay. Now let's talk about the same thing that we just did, but for quadratic gravity. Basically, again, you're gonna get curvature squared and curvature. A curvature and curvature squared terms, your cosmological constant could be added. It doesn't change anything, but I'm dropping it. The, when you analyze the spectrum here, there's actually a bunch of states. There's some gauge states, which I'm not displaying for spin one and the like. The spin zero sector has a propagator like this, except with an overall minus sign. Um, if you choose the sign of the couplings wrong, you get a tachyon. So that's what tachyon in this case for me means a pole at space like Q squared, not time like Q squared. So that seems too dangerous, so we don't do that. Um, the this case has, does have the, the spin zero sector. The high mass state comes entirely from the curvatures, scalar curvature squared term. Um, it gives you a normal resonance, in other words, the correct sign. And the abnormal one is the massless state, which turns out to be a gauge artifact. So the spin zero piece it is normal plus a gauge artifact. Um, so it, it's not the problem. The spin two piece, again, if you choose the sign to avoid tachyons, you're gonna end up with a, a ghost-like state. Um, 
at high mass, just like our little example that we, scalar example that we worked through. And um, it's gonna, it's gonna behave like our scalar example did. Um, if I do that, I the spin two propagator, the denominator looks like Q squared, some coupling constants that's kappa squared is like the um, inverse Newton constant. Um, the C is that parameter that we saw there. There's uh, loops that depend on the number of particles. But the main thing is that this gives an imaginary part um, where the propagator looks roughly like that, you know, up to some irrelevant momentum dependence, which when you're near the high mass pole has a minus I and a minus I gamma. Um, if you can see off to the side here, there's, there's a, a, a blip in the spectrum. Um, it's, it, it differs from the normal resonance. Normal resonance has plus I gamma there, which is basically converted to that. Um, I'm gonna argue that it's the time reversed version of a reson usual resonance. When we do causality, I'm gonna talk about time reversal a little bit more. Time reversal is anti-unitary. Anti-unitary means you complex conjugate everything. So you complex conjugate this, you get that. You complex conjugate normal resonance, you get a this guy. Um, it's important that the imaginary parts of the diagrams are the same. That's actually important for unitarity. And I will now show you that it still corresponds to a decaying particle, not a growing particle. So if I look at if I decompose the propagator into time orderings, there's forward propagation, there's backwards propagation, um, depending on the sign of the time. The forward propagation is the usual one. What we tend to call positive frequencies is propagated forward and negative frequencies is propagated backwards. The, the other part of it, the other pole, it sort of does the reverse. First, let's point out that it's a decaying amplitude. So in both cases, it decays, it doesn't grow. It, the, it however, does what we normally call positive energy backwards in time and negative energy forward in time. So it's the reverse of the usual one. Okay. Um, if you form propagators with retarded boundary conditions, so as if you're trying to take classical limits, again, the same sort of feature happens. You get um, the usual retarded propagator is, is the usual one, but the, the, in the forward direction, but in backwards time direction, it has these decaying exponentials and the other features. So backwards, there are backwards propagations in a retarded boundary conditions case, which, but they have a finite lifetime. Okay, so that's, that's the funny features that you see here. Um, there doesn't seem to be any instability due to the growing nature, to growing exponentials, at least in these propagators. Okay, here's the place that where quantum field theory does have troubles. There, as we've, you might guess, given what I've just said about propagation, there's causality violations on short scales. And this actually goes back to the time of Lee and Wick and Coleman, um, where, where Lee and Wick were studying higher derivative theories 
involving uh, things like E and M, trying to make a finite theory of E and M by adding higher derivatives. Um, and here, but here we can see we've we've now set up all the the stuff that we need to to see this. We're going to see that the causality. There's something which I will call an arrow of causality, which is different for the normal fields and for this unstable ghost. So first of all, causality isn't in field theory cause before effect. When we do that time decomposition of a propagator, there is backwards propagation that occurs. And that's, that's important that the, there's forward propagation for positive energy and backward propagation with negative energy and the the that backward propagation is important to enforce uh, important causality conditions, but it's not cause before effect. It's just a, a very special combination of of um, forward and backward propagation. The you don't see this because uh, the uncertainty principle shields it. it. It propagates backwards for times that are of order the the energy differences, you can't resolve that. But nevertheless, that's what the usual thing is. We, when, when we discuss causality in field theory, we make the special, the, the condition being that operators commute for space like separation. And for fields commuting, the propagation that I just talked about is important. Um, so the causality is, is generally described by the commentations of field operators vanishing if they're space-like separated. However, there is an additional feature of causality that, um, sorry, I don't know why, what happened here, um, that, that's important. What is it that determines the past light cone and the future light cone? The, the um, that's, that's a feature of the causality too. And all particles have to share that to have a causal theory because if you produce some that have one directionality and others that have another, then you'll violate causality. It, and you, if you trace it back, it comes from the I epsilons. The basic principle is that there are states are positive energy. Um, the I epsilon determines that positive energies propagate forward in time. And so that's, that's where the, the directionality comes. What if, what if, I did this before, but let's just do it again. Let's use, um, we see where that, that comes from. Um, so I did before I did when I did the propagate the path integral over the ghost, I was using the the action with a funny minus sign. Here, let's just do it again. Generating functions with either sign. Um, I make it better defined by adding a small convergence factor. Sorry. Um, I get. I get either the usual Feynman propagator or the complex conjugated version of one, because again, this is the only only I in the theory at the start. I'm taking the complex conjugate to go from one sign to the other. When you end up is the time reverse propagator, it propagates positive energy backwards in time. And so the, the poles in this, are governed by the, the signs of the I epsilon give you a different arrow of causality. This actually has implications for even philosophic treatments of, of the arrow of time. Typically, people who are worried about the arrow of time say that the laws of physics don't distinguish between the past and the future. It's not correct. The 
laws of quantum physics have an arrow. That arrow is determined by the factors of I in the quantization procedure, either in the commutation rules or in the path integral. And that those choices determine your arrow of time. We, by convention, use the one with the e to the is as our quantization. Here, we run into trouble. We've got field with dueling arrows of, of causality. Usual propagators, the massless part of the graviton propagator goes with the usual one. The massive one goes with the opposite. And who wins that battle? As a fight between two different um, arrows, it's the massive state has to ends up decaying and the stable state wins. So overall, our causality is de decided by the stable state, but the massive state causes trouble in the meantime, in the short scales. There is some phenomenology of this, which I don't think I'll go, go through. You, If you were looking for it, you would look for funny vertex displacements, early arrivals, um, resonances that propagate backwards on the argon diagram. These, these are all buried if I'm applying this to gravity because they're roughly of the Planck scale, parametrically of the Planck scale. And so they don't provide any conflict with experiment. The question remains only whether they make the theory so badly defined that they, it makes the theory impossible. We haven't seen that. Um, you might you think that, that it basically just becomes a causality and uncertainty, and I think that's what the right answer is. Um, but you might think that a causal uncertainty is going to be a general property of quantum gravity. Anyhow, things will be un, uncertain because space-time fluctuates at the, at the Planck scale. So this may not be anything particularly terrible for gravity theory. Okay, so that's two of my three main topics. And it's stability, it seems to pass the stability test. I've done causality, it fails causality test, but only at the Planck scale. The other, the other ingredient that we'd worry about is unitarity. Now, and if I were presenting this in a different order, I would particularly worry about unitarity because I might not know what to, how to do a unitarity sum with ghosts in here. Okay, so because, you know, do I put the ghost in that state or not? And this is actually a, a, an interesting question, which is, however, solved, but not totally well known. When you do a unitarity sum, who counts in that? The foundations of S matrix theory have the, all these states being asymptotic states, so states at asymptotic infinity. And so you would say that foundationally only stable states should count in here, things that can make it to infinity. Yet you know that if you're doing a calculation, let's say with Ws, Ws are unstable, you often would put them in the unitarity sum when you're doing some unitarity relation. So who who counts? Do you know when we when we do free field quantization, we'd put everybody in here. Then you turn on interactions, and some states become unstable, and you take them out of here. Um, anyway, development addressed this early on. And the, the correct answer is that only stable states go here. So 
the correct answer for Ws is you only put the decay products in. You only put electrons and neutrinos in those states in, in the unitarity sum because they form the asymptotic Hilbert space. You don't, you, in principle, you don't make cuts on unstable resonances like the W or, or even the pi on. But of course, that seems a bit funny. Um, it, you seem like you're removing states from the theory when you turn interactions on. And we also know that some states are almost stable, like pions. Do you treat them as stable and you're, you're not making a bad approximation? This is a narrow width approximation. But Veltman is in fact correct. And we'll see that the narrow width approximation is justified when the width is small. But nevertheless, the correct answer is you only put the asymptotic particles in here. This is going to be a relevant thing, a relevant thing, not in the case of the unstable ghosts. They don't actually appear in the unitarity relation just their decay products. If their decay products are normal, then we end up satisfying unitarity in the usual way. So let's see. So first the advertisement, which I'm not gonna do it this way. Um, with Gabriel, we, took Veltman's pathway and did exactly what Veltman did, which is a very painful way of doing it. There's circling rules and largest time equations and you get the Kikowski's cutting rules out of this. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's, it's a rigorous way to treat this. And we, we followed that. And there is some difference when you have these unstable states with energy flows. Um, but nevertheless, the proof goes through um, unchanged. And it, what, what was important in it is that we didn't have to do any analytic continuation. Everything is done in Minkowski space. Um, here's, here's how th this works. I'll give do some examples. Um, and you can then see that it's going to work for these heavy particles. Um, with funny rules. The basically when you calculate the discontinuity, you put all the intermediate states on shell. You also on the far side of the cut, you use the complex conjugation, conjugate of the usual propagator. So this, the usual propagator on the far side of the cut, if, if there's a piece over there, you use the complex conjugate. Now there's several, many textbooks actually don't mention that part of the rule, um, but nevertheless, it's correct. Um, in this case, it's a, you, you just cut the propagators, you get, that the discontinuity is like the two-body decay width with some factor. Um, if you plug this into a resonance propagator, you have a series, sorry, a series of cuts, the simple one, and then here you're using the complex conjugate rules. The bubble sum on each side is the same. And so this, this has the usual propagators on one side and the complex conjugated propagators on the other side. The, the, um, the result is that you get the discontinuity in the resonance propagator is um, just as D, D star, and the width D and D star then enter. So since these ghosts have the complex conjugate as their propagator, this is the same. So the discontinuities for both of these are the same. 
I realize I skipped the slide, which is my, one of my favorite slides is about Merlin modes. Maybe if we have time, we go back and do it later, show it later. But anyhow, I'm calling this heavy mass resonance with the with the complex conjugated propagator the Merlin mode. Um, May I ask a question? Just to uh, yes, okay, I, yes. I should have asked it earlier, maybe. Um, so the ghosts, in principle, interact also with normal matter. That's right. If they are unstable, that may cause the vacuum being unstable. Uh, is that a problem? Because I, I remember there were discussions in the cosmological context of having some ghost mm, mm, particles, yeah. which yeah. Uh, at the end looks like they lead to a uh, very short-lived universe because of that instability. Right. So the yeah, so the, this instability, at least near Minkowski, is not is is not is not an instability. If you chose the coupling constants have the opposite sign, then there'd be a tachyon instability. And I suspect that that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, the, the signs of these terms have been used, have, have, have been employed in the literature in, with both signs. One sign leans to tachyons, which is definitely going to cause these troubles. The other sign leads to this unstable positive energy states, which seems not to at least near Minkowski. Okay, no, but I, 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 I think I, I had in mind really instability of not a tachyonic one, but the ghost decaying into a, a something else. Yeah. Leading and interacting with normal matter leading not not just the gravitons but yes yeah. else leading to instability of the vacuum of the whole theory yeah but maybe the sorry maybe that's not really yeah i think i think it's not no. happening here um at least near minkowski so one of the things i'm going to say later on is the stability far from minkowski is not known okay okay um i'm doing it and other people have done it small perturbations from minkowski um this seems in all the cases to be stable at large scales i don't know the answer and i mean that could be a potential flaw anyhow i'll i'll, I'll mention stability again for that part okay but the things that we've done here when we've studied stability and other people have done it too um have found it to be stable, even including the decay to the um, normal matter. In fact, normal matter helps it be stable. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So my, my point here is that discontinuities here in this case are, are the same as they are for normal resonances, even with this funny behavior. And it it's holds true also for three particle cuts. I don't, don't think I need to take you through this. The discontinuities here um, come from the cuts in the, on the stable particles and they're related to the width of the particle. Now, this is the slide that gives you the connection to um, this narrow width approximation where you treat the particle as if it was stable and take the cuts through this. So here we've gotten the correct answer by only doing cuts on the stable states and not on the resonance state. This shows you how in the limit that the width goes to zero, this is equivalent to cutting on the resonance state. So basically, here's the answer that we got for both those calculations, one of which I talked you through, the other which I didn't. This is the discontinuity. But this turns out when the width is small to be a representation of a delta function, 
And if I take the limit of this, as the width becomes small, I get the usual cutting rules. So here I've cut only on the decay products. In the limit, it's equivalent to cutting on the, the resonant state. But the interesting feature having done it this way is that this, this was true up here, independent of whether the, um, it was the usual resonance or one of these funny ghosts with complex conjugated propagators. And so then I get the usual cutting rule for even also the, the heavy ghosts. And this ends up giving the unitarity back. It's, it's, um, The, this is the heuristic proof of unitarity. It's it's not what we I mean, what we did is go through Veltman's proof and generalize it, but basically unitarity works for stable particles as external states. You cut through the stable particles; it's the same, independent of the type of resonances. Um, he proved that normal resonances satisfy unitarities to all orders, and then the Merlin's do too. These others, these funny particles, do too. Um, here's an example. I guess I have time to do it a little bit. Um, here's one where I go straight through that scattering channel. Um, I scatter into the channel with some initial states, do the resonance sum here in between, do a partial wave decomposition, look at the propagators. Um, I get out some scattering amplitude. Unitarity implies a relationship among the 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 imaginary parts and the squared amplitude. It implies a structure like, like this. The imaginary part is, is a squared over the sum of the squares. This square of this is a squared over the sum of the squares. Um, the calculation that I just did ends up having exactly that structure. So it satisfies unitarity. Despite the, despite the fact that it goes right through this hole that seems to have the wrong sign. The only thing that's different about this is this, this stays on the, if you know argon diagrams, this is a argon diagram it shows how the phase shift behaves as a function of energy. This goes backwards around the argon diagram, but it stays on the, the diagram. Um, there is, however, at this stage, a, a somewhat of a complication is that if you are st starting not by doing the cuts over the stable states, but start from the free field theory, you actually, for this ghost state, you have your poles in the in the wrong place, and you don't actually get the the same answer as I just got. So I've done the direct calculation of the discontinuity. You don't get that. Um, this part seems to be to be impossible to present in a quick seminar, but just you can sort of see that it's you're not going to get the same answer. Um, Lee and Wick encountered this already back when they were discussing higher derivative QED. And they proposed a counter that gives a contour that gives the correct answer, the usual unitary answer. Um, it goes around the poles slightly differently. Um, it's compatible with the usual Wick rotation. And this then is the contour that you have to use in some diagrams in order to keep unitarity. This is a bit of a funny feature, and this is then part of what I think is not understood about the, the theory beyond leading order, beyond the order that I've discussed things. So far, I've been basically working up to one loop order, a little bit of two loop stuff. There's, there's things that we don't understand about this. So, so far, to summarize the stuff, so far it seems to be stable, it seems to be 
unitary, it seems to violate causality on small scales. Um, it, but it's stable near Minkowski. The, the stability at higher curvatures, higher energies is, well, at higher curvatures anyhow, where the curvatures are close to the high mass pole are not understood at all at this stage. Um, so it, there could be more instabilities there. If it's insta instable, that could still be okay. I mean, you could view inflation as an instability because it's an exponential growth, but it ends up in a benign final state. The what happens to that? The if there is an instability, does it collapse to singularities, or does it end up with some lower energy, low, more stable state as its end product? So that's unknown. There's there's worries about higher order calculations. The, the all that's been done so far is simple bubble diagrams. This Lee Wick theories were explored a bit by Kikowski and colleagues in, in the 60s. And they found some diagrams which um, were not, uh, were, it seemed dangerous. We don't really know what happens here. We may need generalizations of the Leewick contour. It's, is it even possible? To, are there instabilities in those diagrams? You know, if you have, since you have negative energy states propagating forward, do they? Does that lead to an instability? Um, Gabriel has been working independently on doing some of these modern unitarity based calculations. And he seems to show that th that can work. Maybe that's the way forward. Can we do lattice simulations to see if these stabilities arguments are, can be non-perturbatively addressed? So I, I mean, I think there's still a lot we don't understand. So this is my summary. And if I have a chance, there's a, at least two slides that I, I somehow skipped over, which I might go back to if you want me to. Anyhow, the summary is that we like quadratic gravity because it's a renormalizable quantum field theory that could potentially be a UV completion for gravity. It has its only stable state is the massless graviton. There is a high mass resonance with funny properties. It's near Minkowski, it seems stable, it seems unitary. And we have this Leewick contour as a field theory technique when doing some calculations. It certainly has a causality violation there, so that's the problem. But we, but so far, this hasn't deterred us to say that this could be a possible completion for quantum gravity. Anyway, that's that's the summary of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? So maybe these two slides you can show us before. Yeah. So let's see where where, where are they where they disappeared. One is sort of a this yeah. So uh, where's I want to. Is no, it's after that. All right. So here's the, the here's the funny one. Um, the reason I call it Merlin modes is the in the. Tales of King Arthur in the English literature, there's a wizard who 
named Merlin who ages backwards in time and that gives him the gift of prophecy. Um, but we do need a, a, a name that's different from just plain ghosts because the Fidea pop of ghosts have the usual I epsilon in the denominator. These modes have a, have a sign change in the denominator and that makes all the difference. If I didn't have that extra sign change in the denominator, I wouldn't have some of these properties. So this going backwards in time and the signs in the denominator are tied together. Oh, here's here's the other one. The other one. It turns out that Coleman in in '69 um, realized that theories like this. He was talking about the Wick theories, but it applies to quadratic gravity also. Obey a modified shalane layman representation where you have the massless state, you have a massive state, you've got the complex conjugate, so it lives on the other part of the, uh, the other side of the cut, and, and a spectral function. These two, their imaginary parts cancel each other. The imaginary part then of this overall, this representation comes from the spectral function, which carries the usual I epsilon. In this representation, the one I talked to you at the start with, we were discussing one pole, which lived slightly above the real axis. Um, here, there's a pair of conjugate poles. There's another pole in the bright figure in the, in the spectral function. So you can have either one pole or three poles in your representation, depending how you want to, to do it. This, in fact, is a exact statement for the for gravity, for quadratic gravity. Um, much of the old literature neglects the fact that there's a pole in the spectral function and just talks about the complex conjugate pole. As far as I know, Grinstein, O'Connell, and Wise were the first to point out that the, the spectral function pole is crucial. Um, the, in most cases, these particles combine up to not have uh, a cut, and the cut comes basically from the spectral function. So this is a, an interesting technical feature. Okay, that was those were the two slides that somehow I missed. Uh, sorry, I would like to ask a question about unitarity, if any. Okay. Um, so uh, back when you were showing that. Uh, you used to post to only uh, only cut stable particles. Yes. Uh, you were also mentioning that we tend to uh, cut unstable as well. So yes. is it? But then, if the result is the same, does it mean that uh, um, just the sum of all cuts of unstable particles needs to vanish, or do we get any, any double counting if we do it? Yeah. You, so one tends to either do one or the other. You, you, you definitely should not do both. Doing both would be wrong. Um, the, the statement is that if you treat a, a resonance as if it was a stable particle and just ignore the fact that it decays, you'll get the right answer in the limit that the whiff is small. Mm -hmm. Equivalently, you could get the right answer by by knowing that it decays and taking your cut on the stable particles, that's always the right answer. So in one case, if you do the stable, the stable particles, you get your discontinuity looking like this, up mm -hmm. where my pointer is circling. Um, if you do the cut on the resonance by itself, if forget about the decay products, you get the, the usual two pi delta. 
Mm. And these are close to each other in the limit when. Right, the, right, yeah. But uh, I, I'm but just. You can do both. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking of, you know, even uh, generalized unitarity context yep. where uh, you right. take an amplitude and uh, you think of uh, all prop propagators as something that, that you can you can cut. Right. And uh, if you know that in this in the theory that you're considering, uh, some of the propagators correspond to unstable particles. Right. Uh, but those are just massive propagators as far as you are concerned. Yes. Uh, should you be cutting them or should you not? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the fully correct answer is that you should only cut the stables. Um, the, the um, almost correct answer is that you can cut the propagators mm -hmm. if you're willing to make a small mistake. So for example, let's, if I'm doing the, an easy example is the pions. If you're doing theory with pions in it, they're strongly interacting particles. You're generally discussing the strong interactions charge pions decay by weak interactions. So if you neglect weak interactions, they would be stable. So if you're interested in only strong interaction properties, just treat them as stable. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a little less clear when, when particles decay with are significant on the scales you're working. Um, so is the is the W and Z narrow with particles or are they, is there with something significant? And that's, mm -hmm. that leads to the, you know, there's a minor uh, sub literature on how to treat unstable particles when you're calculating them. Do you use the pole mass for the Z or do you use other masses? And so it becomes a, an interesting and non-trivial quantum field theory problem on how to to do this in totally correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but the so if you're doing these generalized unitarity, it, it the answer the correct answer depends on what what you're trying to do with the the result. Yeah, yeah. You, you usually in generalized unitarity, you you want to reconstruct the amplitude without. Um, without doing all the work from, from its analytic structure. And right. uh, that is defined by the propagators, whether they are stable particles uh, or not, right? So right. You, you might want to really cut everything uh, just to get all the information that you can possibly get. Uh, so that, that might be a different context from what you are considering here. Yeah, could be. Um, yeah, okay, thank yeah. you. Other questions? I have a question, but maybe somebody else wants to ask. I don't know. Uh, maybe you could repeat <coughs> the argument why the argument of Ostrogratsky is kind of is not valid. So you said that it's not may not be equivalent to the original dynamic. Right. But... Right. So so I mean I think at its at its heart. Um it comes down to the fact that Ostrogradsky was using a particular set of coordinates to enforce Hamilton's equations. Quantum field theory doesn't, doesn't really use that. It, it either does, its goal is to get the spectrum out. If you're doing canonical quantization, you form your Hamiltonian to determine your energy eigenstates. The, the, you end up choosing different coordinates, different momentum in, to, uh, to do these goals. The, the path integral treatment is, is slightly different, but also is closer to canonical quantization. And so it, it presumably comes down to the fact that either 
Hamilton's equations uh, are not that important for in the in the <coughs> unchanged form are not that important at least in some higher derivative theories for the quantization of higher derivative theories or there may be more than one choice that that's relevant um, certainly the pathway that that you go through the quantum theory doesn't correspond at all to Ostrogradsky's construction. You don't choose phi and phi dot as your coordinates. You choose, you choose other field variables. But so path integral should not depend on auxiliaries because these auxiliary fields from uh, from the variation. Right. So, but the path integral, uh, the path integral. Um, that's right. I don't think the path integral determ determines depends on that. But for the path integral, you you're starting from a Lagrangian anyhow. You don't. You're not. Um, you're not directly forming the Hamiltonian. You you don't have to choose what your canonical momentum are. You just do the path integral. And the if you do that, if you if you say take your path integral and then choose go to the take the classical limit of that answer you don't get the same thing that Ostrogazzi does by his choice of coordinates it's just a different construction but I um and so from the quantum mechanical point of view Ostrogazzi's choice of coordinates looks very odd Okay, so and even classically, you would not say that it uh, indicates any instability, right? Right. Yeah. So I, I, but by taking the classical limit of the path integral, I don't get any instability because you don't get the high derivative theory in the end in the classical. Right. I, I've integrated out the yeah. the part that gives the higher derivative theory, and the integral in, in this case was innocuous. So, so, so the Ostrogatsky problem was a classical problem for the uh, theory that does not exist anymore. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I have two questions. So one is a kind of uh, abstract one. <laughs> so suppose the theory is actually conformal. Yeah. Uh, what will happen? Uh, well, there will be no true logs in uh, some Green's functions. Uh, so, what will happen in this case? There will be no instability and no decay of ghosts. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but of course, you're going to end. Up, so, if I was trying to make this conformal, I would only keep the vial squared term and drop drop the other two terms in this action um i would still end up with a conformal anomaly yeah no, but i had in mind uh, not gravity say just uh, some high derivative theory scalar yeah making it kind of conformal in some way yeah um, yeah and so i guess the well i don't i i won't be able to answer it really but the question is whether whether there is an anomaly or whether it remains conformal at the loop level. Okay. Uh, yeah, the second question is kind of more practical. So if we don't, if we, if we don't trust this uh, classical theory, so we don't, we're not going to look for black hole solutions, compare them with Einstein theory, uh, what actually we are going to compare to <clears throat> any observations. So yeah. as matrix for gravitons or? Yeah, so. <clears throat> uh, clearly, the field theory techniques are best developed for scattering problems, and so yes, we would. The first things you would do are trying to do S matrix theories. Um, you know, it's possible that that one should could do a quantum corrected effective action and look for solutions to the quantum corrected effective action. It would be non-local. Um, but you could imagine trying that anyhow. 
um, that it's certainly where I would, if I was trying to do something for solutions, usual gravitational type solutions, I would try doing a non-local one loop effective action, including some of these, these logs that, that I've discussed and look to see if I can make statements about classical solutions of that theory. I mean, there's indications that, that the equations of motion aren't, aren't unstable. There's people like Bob Holdham and Kelly Stella and collaborators. And also there's a recent paper by, unfortunately I'm forgetting the names, um, have looked at classical solutions and they seem themselves to just as solutions to not be unstable. Uh, they differ at higher curvatures from general relativity solutions. So things that limit to Schwarzschild black holes at large masses have either two horizons or no horizons at lower scales. I, yeah, but I guess it's, it boils down to boundary conditions or initial conditions. If so you can try to sort of eliminate unstable options uh, to... it'd be nice i mean it, it, it'd be nice to it, there have been solutions that are non-singular at the origin that look like schwarzschild at large scales um there they are not the what i advocated the one loop effective actions they're just the usual classical action but you do what you can, you know, you, at this stage, it's hard to solve the one loop effective actions and find solutions to them because they're non-local. It's a, it's a bear of a problem. You do what you can do. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, if no, then thank you again for a nice talk. Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone for coming.